Welcome to the demo cast, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, here in the studio with me today, uh, we have um, Mark Smith, who is the, uh, our, he's our resident chief mechanical officer, and he also guides our artificial intelligence team in developing some of our artificial intelligence algorithms that we use in the rail car inspection portal. We also have uh, Derek Schmeck. He's our vice president of research development and innovation. And joining us remotely today, we have Greg Firmage. Uh, Greg is the principal architect and operations director of CalRay. So thank you very much for joining us today, Greg. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for the invite. Mark, to start us off, uh, we're talking about the rail car inspection portal. Can you give us a, a basically a high level overview of, you know, what the rail car inspection portal is, what it does, and how it services our railroad clients? Uh, sure, Jeff. Um, what our rail inspection portal does is it uh, it takes images of a train 360 ground, uh, 360 degrees around it uh, using our camera system, and, and what that does is it gives the mechanical uh, employees. Uh, an opportunity to visually inspect a train entering and or leaving a rail yard. Um, and what that does, you know, entering the rail yard, uh, they can predetermine what defects they may have, have their forces available to ready to fix those. So it doesn't, uh, you know, have to come out of the contest. Right. And also it, leaving the rail yard, it gives um, mechanical forces an opportunity to look for those things that's happened since it left the yard that can cause a mainline stoppage or even worse, uh, a derailment. And bottom line is, it, it, we like to say here, it turns finders into fixers. And the, the big picture is it decreases your dwell time and increase, increases your velocity in your rail yard. That's, it sounds like, I mean, obviously there's a lot of benefit to the rail car inspection portal to our um, uh, railroad customers. Um, when we're talking about uh, freight trains, how fast is that? How, how fast do we, uh, do we process those things? How, how, how fast does it work? Yeah, we can process up to um, 60 to 70 miles an hour for freight and higher speeds for passenger. Um, well, that, I mean, um, th that's pretty incredible because uh, 60, 70 miles an hour for uh, high resolution images. And these are really high resolution images that we're talking about, right? Because you're inspecting them. Um, and anybody in the audience who've actually have, have seen samples of our high resolution images, uh, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. How do we actually, uh, and, and Derek, this is probably a question better for you. How, do, how are we able to capture that amount of data that fast? So we use a number of technologies from specialized lighting to industrial machine vision cameras. Uh, we combine that with a specialized IT infrastructure in order to capture those images, processes those images, as well as pipeline them through our AI algorithms to identify mechanical flaws and safety issues. Right. Um, so uh, and we that, generate and about five gigabytes per car as a, okay. you know, if that if kind of a number for what yeah. we're looking at. And that's per rail car. So an average, car. an average train, a hundred and some cars long, that's a lot of data in a very short yeah, amount exactly. of time. Exactly. Um, and, and that's for freight cars, right? So I know about, you know, about two years ago, uh, we, we started developing our system for high-speed passenger rail. Uh, what, are, uh, what are the speeds there? Can you tell me how that differs? What were some of the challenges there? So on that particular project, our uh, target speed was 125 miles per hour. Um, what that means is we are doubling the throughput of images that are coming into the infrastructure. Um, the typical storage environment that we were using, that we are using in our freight and uh, rail inspection portal doesn't handle that, that velocity. So we had to come up with a specialized storage system in order to capture those images. In this scenario, we were um, generating over 60 gigabytes per second of mm -hmm. uh, image data. And then we uh, needed the ability to not at the same time, be able to process those images mm -hmm. and run them through our artificial intelligence to keep from having delays in uh, in the uh, notifications, mm -hmm. et cetera. Processing, right. And so we reached out to uh, our partners and came to CalRay where we uh, were able to, to uh, utilize their storage system in order to uh, achieve those speeds and the uh, okay. necessary features and functionality. Good. Um, 
Well, Greg, I, I, I guess this one, uh, you know, we'll go to you now, right? Uh, I think most of the folks in our audience probably familiar with Duos Tech. Um, many of them may not have heard of, of CalRay. Can you maybe introduce us to yourself and the company? Of course, and thank you very much. <clears throat> so, yeah, so my name is uh, Greg Fermage. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, I'm Principal Architect and Operations Director at CalRay. Um, my role is to uh, architect next generation storage platforms to support uh, in institutions and organizations like Duos to to uh, innovate, uh, to, um, you know, become come up with new ideas and faster ways of doing things and solving problems. Um, so a little bit about Calray. Um, so Calray is a, is a French semiconductor company. Um, and within the portfolio, they have uh, two, two product sets, I suppose. So, so one is a processing unit known as a DPU. Um, so, you know, you may have been hearing terms of CPUs and GPUs. Um, Calray Architects and uh, makes DPUs, data processing units. And the second part of the business, which is where I, I sort of more aligned, is around a software-defined storage platform. Um, and fundamentally, what, what we're looking to do is um, offer our customers the opportunity to architect storage solutions based on their workflows. And so uh, in, for, for Duos, you know, as, as Derek talked about, some of, the, some of the numbers that they needed to achieve the project were very high, huge amounts of bandwidth to ingest all of those images and then process them. And what we, we effectively do is um, we have a parallel file system at the core of our platform. Um, and for, if you're not familiar with what that means, in very simple terms, if you had 10 individual hard drives, um, you would only have 10 one hard drive pipes. Whereas what we do is effectively make one 10 drive pipe. And that, that you know, that could be 20, 50, 100. So it can scale to meet the actual business requirements that um, that our customers need. And so the challenge that uh, Derek gave us was, you know, very high ingest speeds. But, uh, you know, we were able to put a solution together uh, with Dell and uh, some other partners to to meet these this this high speed rail challenge. Yeah, that's excellent and incredible work, by the way. I know that our team has worked, I think, with your team probably over the last a uh, little over a year now, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and yep. obviously, we value each one of our collaborative relationships with our technical vendors. Uh, they're very important to what it is that we do here at Duos Tech, and uh, it kind of helps us move forward. Um, and, and, you know, look, there's lots of choices when it comes to technology. There's new companies springing up to do all kinds of things all the time. That is technology. So, so Greg, can you um, let us know a little bit about uh, kind of what sets CalRay apart? So there's, there's, a, there's a few terms and things that, uh, that, that set us apart from standard storage people um, or products. Uh, so one is, you know, we, we don't do hardware ourselves. We work with partners to do that. And so typically our main, our main partner is Dell. Um, and the way I look at this, our relationship with Dell for our solutions is Dell is like a big box of Lego. Uh, so uh, someone might come to us with a, a storage challenge um, that may have different requirements for different workflows. And effectively, we're able to go put our hands into the, the Dell Lego box and take the right parts of hardware to, to architect the solution. And what fundamentally what that means is that we're, you know, we, we can architect a hardware solution for storage that meets the workflow requirement rather than the workflow requirement having to uh, compromise because of storage hardware technology. And, and we're able to do mixed workloads with that. So, you know, you basically you'll you know, be able to process the data in the way it's needed, which, as we'll come to sort of cover a little bit later on, is pretty important into the life cycle of any sort of data set. The second part of what we do is around data management, where we're here to give our customers insight into the data itself. You know, that, that's where the real value is. Just storing it and processing it is one thing, but understanding where it is, being able to find it, that's another part of it as well. You know, the hybrid environments, uh, you know, we, in, we're able to do hybrid storage solutions that mean in a data center, maybe in a container, but also potentially in the cloud. And again, to optimize those workloads for what a customer might need. And, and fundamentally, you know, one thing we try and do is um, maximize the hardware investment. We will extract every piece of performance that we can from those, those hardware building blocks to, 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 again, maximize the return of investment for, from, from our customer. Uh, and the last part of it, again, is we're predictably scalable. Um, and, you know, Derek can, can sort of uh, back this up a little bit. You know, if we have a, a building block that is 1x for performance and 1y for capacity, if we add a second one, it scales linearly. So it's entirely predictable. And, you know, there aren't really any limits in terms of where that scalability ends. And so putting all those things together, 
um, gives our customers a best of breed environment. We give them true insight into the data, but also the flexibility to, to scale and, and adapt to the changing workload needs that they have. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, and, and you mentioned, I, I know uh, uh, you, you mentioned how your team was working with the Duos team to kind of solve some of those challenges. Is there any, any other challenges when we were approaching high-speed rail is there any more detail about the uh, uh, how we solved some of those challenges uh, from Calray's side? I, I, I think the big, the biggest challenge was around the ingest and understanding. You know, all of the cameras have slightly different uh, ways of uh, generating images and file sites and you know different things. And to be able to cope with that sort of very heterogeneous type of data ingest meant that we 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 had to do some testing. And again, luckily we you know we have a great partner with Dell that we have a, a lab that we're able to do um, benchmarking simulations of the of the solution that will allow us to do it. So in terms of uh, the solution that we're talking about today for this first generation, um, you know, it's it's basically uh, we have our management nodes, which are kind of the brains of the outfit that understand what's going where. But actually, the heavy lifting is what part of our NG Box platform, which are based around NVMe technology, which is a, a very fast performance hard drives um, w within the Dell servers. And uh, coupled with that, of course, this you know is the, the the fast networking that basically allows us to ingest from the the um, the cameras themselves, but also you know, the processing of the data, the raw data. And, you know, on the other side of that is uh, a number of processing units with the Duos AI technology and, and packages on there to do the processing. So, you know, we, we were doing a heterogeneous, just, just ingesting one side wasn't the big challenge. We also had to then do reading and writing while the processing engines were, you know, accessing the data and writing results back out. So it, it took a little bit of time because the numbers were quite high. Um, you know, I was quite confident on paper and, you know, Derek did a lot of work on the paper side of things. But, you know, paper is one thing. Actually doing it in in, in anger, I suppose, is a different thing. And, and again, we were able to sort of simulate a lot of this uh, pr prior to actually putting, you know, putting the thing together properly. Yeah, I mean, that that that's excellent. Derek, I know your team has worked very well along with CalRay. And, and obviously, we have a, a tremendous success in being able to do this. But I want the audience to realize as well. Um, what's this overall need for speed? What is that? And, and our solution, uh, the rail car inspection portal, uh, obviously what we promise to deliver is actionable intelligence. Um, the issue is uh, intelligence is, is only actionable if it's delivered in a timely manner. And that's why all of this technology comes into play. That's why we're talking about so much detail. Um, so Mark, maybe you can help us bring it back to reality for us, bring it back to high level a little bit. Um, kind of out of the detail. Uh, let's talk about um, how is this, how, how's AI, for example, how's our artificial intelligence and our machine uh, learning algorithms, how, how do our customers benefit from that? I mean, from a high level, from a business standpoint. Yeah, um, sure. Like I said, on the on the back end, uh, um, I, I take with Cal Ray and Derek's team and they provide me the images. Um, and then we go, in my team, we go through and we pick out those targeted Errors that need, you know, uh, need to be looked at, mm -hmm. um, and then you know we take those images, we label them. Uh, our engineers they build the model, they train the model, um, and, and what that gives is it gives the mechanical forces uh, a more robust, targeted inspection. Mm -hmm. um, so, and with the speed that we process all this at, it, it gives you near real time usable data um, that the railroads can can benefit yeah. from. Yeah, and and that's a perfect use case for artificial intelligence and machine learning. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we're, I, I go to a lot of talks, um, I attend a lot of panels, and uh, we're always talking about valuable use cases for artificial intelligence and all the derivations there from. And, and we, uh, this always comes up as being a real practical and real life use case. Um, Greg, in, in your, when you're uh, talking to your customers and your prospects and in your industry in general, what are you hearing uh, uh, as far as AI is concerned? What are the new uh, uh, magic words in AI? <clears throat> so I think the two, yeah, AI and machine learning have been around for, for a little while, but uh, the new sort of buzzwords on the street is generative AI, which has a slightly different use case. But um, pretty much what we're seeing now is pretty much all organizations uh, are doing some kind of AI. It doesn't matter which market vertical they're in, they're, they're, they're doing some kind of thing to be, you know, to do predictions. Um, and, and the challenge with it is, you know, with all of these people trying to go and get get involved with AI, 
is, um, you know, it's a little bit like uh, the American frontier, I think, where, um, you know, there's gold in them, their hills, but, you know, how to get to it and avoid the bears and the pitfalls, et cetera, is a challenge. And, you know, the, the fact is people only know what they think they know at, at the start. And, and what happens is they tend to um, realize once they start down the path that all of a sudden there are three or four different directions that you can head from it. And some of the things that we're trying to do, you know, when it comes to this, because, you know, the, typically with these type of workloads, you know, there's the processing unit, there's there's a network to be able to talk to those processing units and let them talk together. There's the storage, which is sort of what we how we contribute. And then, you know, you need some kind of resource management. And but the thing is with it, once you start going down the path, it's you, you, you some people tend to find they need to adapt and change. And so from a storage point of view, as I go back to my Lego analogy, um, you know, we're, we're very tactically scalable. Um, so if uh, a, a potential customer sort of started down a route and realized actually now they're doing it in, in the real world, uh, they need to change direction or pivot then we can add what we need to, to give them that capability. Because the simple fact is, and as the next slide will show, these sort of AI workloads, they're complicated. You know, every single one of the sort of the ingest preparation, this is all part of the, 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 the life cycle of any AI processing. And each of them has different challenges that you need to address. But typically people don't quite understand which parts they need to focus on as part of their workflows. And you know this, you know this talk about constrained capacity for checkpointing or uh, highly varied I/O profile. And so, like I said, what we've tried to do is give our customers the flexibility to adapt as as they need, feel find that they need to adapt. We can work with them from the storage point of view. And with generative AI, that takes it a, a step further because basically, once you've finished one set of data set, you start again reprocessing on that data set. And the challenge for that is, of course, that data set keeps constantly growing and growing. And so, being able to scale both not from just a, a performance point of view, because obviously as the data set gets, set gets larger, you need more, more things to process, but actually to store the data as well. And those, those are the challenges that we, we're sort of seeing in the marketplace that we're, the, we're trying to address with our building block approach for the solution. Yeah, absolutely. It's a lot of the same things that, uh, that, that I'm hearing as well in, in the circles that I travel in. Uh, you mentioned two things, you know, two types of, well, not, it's two uses of AI really. Uh, one is predictive analytics, which uh, I've, I've promised, uh, you know, future uh, uh, blogs and, and maybe even a demo cast because uh, it, it's kind of related to our subscription offering that we want to talk about uh, in, a, in another session. Um, but more relevant um, is the uh, generative AI uh, that we've been hearing a lot about lately. And so maybe we go to Mark. Mark, uh, are we... Uh, I know we've, we've started using generative AI several months ago. Can you tell us exactly how we're making use of that and what we're doing in our business with generative AI? Um, right. And kind of going back to what Paul said, I mean, we, we have in-house now our own retraining pipeline. Our, so our data set continually grows. And also, uh, you know, and most of the audience are railroaders or have been around it, uh, you know, a rail, a rail car, there are certain parts that just don't break that often, mm -hmm. um, but they're targeted inspection areas. And so we need lots of images to train the AI. So we, we use that kind of a little differently. We, we take that and make what doesn't break that often. We generate to where we have a sample images of what it could potentially look like, you know, right. with the anomalies in it. So that's, that's kind of what we're doing with it right now. So in short, we're just, we're, we're using uh, generative AI um, to make our algorithms better. Correct. To, to more thoroughly train them and make them better over time. Um, that's, that's like I said, that's excellent. That's exactly what we want to do at, at Duos Check. Um, you know, hopefully we provided uh, uh, some insight uh, into some of the things we do under the hood to, to kind of make all of this technology work to the benefit of our rail car inspection uh, or our rail car, our rail customers. Um, and so hopefully it's given some insight and uh, kind of spawn new thought and maybe some, you know, more appreciation for the technology that goes into the solution. Um, I think we're running up against time now, but we're ready to uh, take some questions. Um, well, I got the first one, let's see. Um, this one says, can an agency using the portal set it up to get real-time alerts electronically, uh, for example, via text? Um, absolutely. As a matter of fact, we, we uh, recently released a software update. It's a software update 3.8. Uh, 
Uh, it was released last month. And one of the uh, features that it has, it's a feature release. And one of the features uh, that it has is uh, uh, it, what we call enhanced notifications. So it allows you to set up alerts and receive those alerts via text, email, or even through an API interface. So it's extremely flexible um, and, and they are as close to real time as possible. Um, so give you an example of how close that is. If you set it up for uh, a typical algorithm that's in, in our solution, uh, you can probably get that message depending on transport, that message is ready to send at least, uh, you know, within 60 to 120 seconds of it occurring. Um, so absolutely, you can, you can set it up to receive those. Um, are there any real world examples or success stories that showcase the positive impact of the RIP system on rail operations and overall efficiency? Mark, maybe you can speak to this. I know we talk to clients all the time and I know they come back with uh, uh, some, some um, kind of metrics on that. Right, um, yes. Um, one of our customers uh, did a side-by-side -side comparison, uh, actual physical inspection versus the same set um, uh, with the uh, rip system and they found they found eight more eight percent more defects using the rip yeah. system than a visual yes also um just the other day another customer um found a car that was running out uh at track speed out of the bowl mm -hmm. and an inspector found it during his visual inspection and they they stopped the consist and set the car out excellent i mean really really positive right. results and may have uh, uh, prevented a, a, an accident. Absolutely, it was it was yeah. it was a derailment waiting to happen. Yeah. Um, how does Duos Technologies Railcar Inspection Portal address the challenges of current railcar inspections? I, I you know I think and I'll let Mark speak to this again, but I, I think we covered that a little bit. But um, it, in my opinion, the railcar inspector assists the mechanical rail car inspector maybe you can uh enlighten us on that uh, correct um it, it kind of goes back to what i said it's it's it will enhance or robust your your inspection in your fleet mechanically speaking mm -hmm. um you're still going to have to have the human sure um a validate what what we find and and two you're still going to have to have that human to go fix it. what it does it when I say finders to fixers, you can redirect your workforces instead of sending everyone out to inspect and then not have time to fix. Right. Now you can have one guy or two guys inspecting and two to three guys repairing. So it doesn't have to come out of the consist. And right. it just depends if you're in a hump yard or if you're in a flat switch yard. Right, right. I, uh, and I love the finders to fixers. I, I think that's perfect. That's, that's beautiful for an elevator pitch. Um, Let's see, what does the software deliverables look like? PDF report, video, photo images, text. Um, okay, so I'm gonna take a shot and answer this a little bit and then I'll maybe pass it over to Derek. Uh, you're feeling a little left out, I see. Um, so we have a, a visual interface, it's called Centrico. It's a graphical user interface. Um, so all of the detections and all of the, uh, the live images in real time, you can see them there, you can do your inspections there. Uh, the software is, is very, uh, uh, it's user friendly, it's intuitive, almost a zero learning curve. Um, the reports and the notifications we're talking about, we do have some PDF reports that are emailed. Um, and, and like I mentioned before, it's text. And uh, I, I don't wanna discount the ability, and maybe Derek, you could speak to this, the integration ability of the system, I think is huge. Uh, you know, we are an easy integrator. We have a a very detailed and sophisticated and comprehensive application programming interface, which really allows this system to be interoperable with, with almost any backend system that a real customer may have. Derek, you want to expand on that a little bit or? No, you pretty much explained it. Oh, sorry about that. I was giving you <laughs> no, <a> that's okay. <laughs> um, do we have time for one more? I think, okay. uh, it's, oh, yeah, I will say this, the, there is a uh, visual representation of Centrico on our website. Uh, I believe um, if you go to www.duostech.com, um, go under the yeah. rail inspection portal, you should be able to see visual representations of what our uh, our Centrico uh, user interface looks yeah. like. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, let's see. Uh, 
are the cameras, and I, I guess this is, uh, are the rail car inspection portals located at all interchange uh, points? Yes. You want to speak to that? Um, no, uh, short answer to that, uh, no, not as of right now. Um, that has been one um, thing I have, you know, mentioned several times in my couple of years here, uh, coming from a rail yard, that was an interchange point. Um, I hopefully one day they are, uh, but as of right now, it's it's kind of up to each individual customer where they would like to have those located. Good. And, and we're always looking, I mean, obviously we're expanding um, day by day. We'll have more, uh, uh, more rail car inspection portals uh, throughout uh, on the rail network. Um, the next question, can you show examples of what defects are picked up by the cameras on a rail car? I don't, I don't think we're ready to show them on this session, but can you speak to some of the, what the rail car mechanic can see and maybe what uh, a few of our algorithms are, maybe what a few of our models right. are? Right. Uh, basically 360 degrees around. Um, uh, we have algorithms uh, that look at draft gear condition. Um, we have uh, cushion unit condition. We have uh, brake, body mounted brake pistons applied, uh, missing securement, uh, cotter keys on the, on the underneath side, undercarriage of the car, uh, open doors, uh, open hoppers, uh, tops and bottoms. Um, we're really looking at our wheel to uh, rail interface mm -hmm. right now. Um, we have um, missing and out of place truck springs, uh, wheel size mismatch. Um, you know, our catalog has has grown quite a bit in the last two years. Um, so yeah, I, but if this is what I tell people, even though we don't have AI for it right now, you can still see it with mm -hmm. the rip system, mm -hmm. uh, like what we said before at near real time mm. yeah don't forget we have the trespasser rider detection system too mm -hmm. that, correct uh, Sorry, captures right. people riding the trains illegally um so for the visual representation that you would see in the user interface the car id itself um, on the screen will be highlighted in red uh, when you click on that red um, indicator it will show a boxed out detection of what was detected in that artificial intelligence model yeah. yeah, and kind of piggyback off of Derek. I mean, even though um, you can, as a user, if you find something that AI model, we don't have an AI model for it, you can absolutely uh, shop a car at any time uh, in, in the system uh, for anything. Um, just you name it, you can uh, type it in. We have uh, all the uh, AAR, Y made, and rules. Uh, incorporated into Centrico or into our Centrico um, user base, uh, so it's all right there for you to do, to do that as well. And um, that's it. We have any other questions coming in, or so there's the one. How many cameras are used? And oh, yep. Do you want to speak? Go ahead and speak to Sorry. that. Sorry. Yeah. How many cameras are used and how many, uh, uh, what angles are, are detected now? We, we pretty much kind of say the sky's the limit on this one. We take uh, multiple angles um, completely, the underneath side of the car. Uh, we actually have a new system that allows us to take, capture the all uh, the surface area of the entire wheels that are going over the track. Yeah. Full rotation. Of full each rotation wheel. of the, the wheels. So you can see the entire surface and the, the entire flange condition of the wheels. Uh, we also have um, all, all the sides, all yeah. the springs. Uh, we, we, we take different approach angles as well to capture around corners that you can't see perpendicularly to the train. Um, and this is a full modular system. So you can buy, you can kind of shop and buy which per, parts of that system you want. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, we're, we're at time. Okay. I got to wrap it up. Um, so, uh, well, you know, first, um, I'd like to um, like to thank our guests, uh, uh, Greg. I'd, I'd like, certainly like to thank you first and foremost for joining us. Uh, I, I do appreciate it, Greg from Calray, and um, uh, Derek and Mark. I appreciate it. If anyone uh, in the audience has additional questions we didn't get to today, or you think of some uh, and you want to send them to us, you can certainly submit questions to sales at duostech.com 
we'll be it'll get to the right place and we'll get you an answer um and i invite you to uh visit our website at uh, uh www.duostech.com and also pay uh, <clears throat> excuse me pay a visit to our partner calray at calrayinc.com i appreciate it thank you very much everyone